Good evening. My name is Gary Hall. I'm the director of the program on values and ethics in the marketplace here at Duke University. My program is honored to be sponsoring this event. First, I'd like to thank uh, my two program assistants, Stephanie, who's not here, and Sarah, who is. Uh, without their tireless efforts, this event would not have been possible. In addition, obviously, I'd like to thank our two debaters and our moderator for taking time out of their busy schedules to educate us on this very crucial topic. Uh, on my left, Dr. Bill McKibben. He is a renowned educator, environmentalist, and author of a dozen books on the environment. He is a founder of the Grassroots Climate Campaign 350.org, which has coordinated 15,000 rallies in 189 countries. Time Magazine called Dr. McKibben, quote, the planet's best green journalist. And the Boston Globe said that he is, quote, probably the country's most important environmentalist. <clears throat> On my right is Alex Epstein. He is the founder and president of the Center for Industrial Progress. He is a Duke grad, O2, and I should add a former student of mine. He was a junior fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute and works as a speaker and consultant for the oil, coal, and natural gas industries. His op-ed articles have been published in, among others, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Investor's Business Daily. Our moderator for tonight's debate, <clears throat> Professor Bill Brown, who is seated right in front of me. He is a distinguished attorney with an extensive career in financial services and as a mediator. <clears throat> he is a professor of Duke Law, where his teaching focuses on entrepreneurship, business law, and business planning. <clears throat> professor Brown is a frequent commentator for a number of organizations, including the BBC, NPR, Bloomberg. <clears throat> he is an arbitrator with the American Arbitration Association, and in addition to his Duke Law degree, Professor Brown holds bachelor's degrees in both biology and political science from MIT back in the ancient times. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much for coming. And without further ado, our moderator, Professor Brown. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your coming here to Duke University tonight to engage in a debate. Uh, Dr. McKibben, Mr. Epstein, we have asked for the two of you to debate resolved. Fossil fuel is a risk to the planet. Dr. McKibben will take the affirmative, and Mr. Epstein will take the negative. Dr. McKibben, you have 10 minutes. Many thanks to all who organized this evening and to Alex for challenging me to this debate. I'm going to speak quickly tonight. The list of risks to our Earth is long. I think it may make it easier for those of you following at home if you uh, try to write down the points in this debate. I'll number my points to make them easier to follow, and I hope Alex will do the same. I urge you to listen closely to the evidence tonight, especially the dates. This is a fast-changing field, and timely information is crucial. Point one, in the past, fossil fuel has been a boon to this planet. This is perhaps obvious, but it is worth stating. And though it's perhaps unseemly to quote oneself, I actually think I put it fairly well in 2008. Coal and oil and gas are miracles, a solid and a liquid and a gas that emerge from the ground pretty much ready to use. They lie at the heart of our modern economy. We should be grateful for the role that fossil fuel played in creating our world and equally grateful that scientists now give us ample warning of its new risks and engineers increasingly provide us with the alternatives that we need. The transition away from fossil fuel won't be simple. It will require great focus and resources if it is to be done quickly, but it is the task of our time. Point two, fossil fuel represents a risk to the oceans. Uh, as the oceans absorb carbon dioxide caused by fossil fuel burning from the atmosphere, they have grown 30% more acidic in the last 40 years. One result, according to the British Antarctic Survey in August 2012, is that marine species are having a much harder time growing skeletons and shells. On the current path, coral reefs will dwindle to insignificance by mid-century. 
And by the century's end, the oceans will be, as the French oceanographer Jean-Michel Gattuso summarized the most recent international symposium five weeks ago, by century's end, our oceans will be hot, sour, and breathless. Point three, fossil fuel is a risk to the cryosphere, our frozen regions. September 2012 saw a record low for Arctic sea ice, shattering old marks. NASA scientist James Hansen declared it a planetary emergency, and The Economist magazine, in a remarkable cover story, called it both a grave danger and one of the greatest changes in human history. The extensive melt changes the planet's albedo, its reflectivity, speeding up warming, and it may also have dramatic effects on weather. In October last month, a study in Nature Geoscience linked Arctic melt to weather extremes in the U.S., and NOAA, again last month, described a physical connection between loss of sea ice and extreme weather in North America. Point four, fossil fuel is a risk, risk to hydrology, to the way that water moves around the earth. Warm air holds more water vapor than cold, a basic physical fact which will do much to explain the 21st century as it unfolds. The atmosphere is 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago, a staggering change. This means destructive deluges are on the increase. The American Meteorological Society in August of this year said heavy rainfalls are up 20% that extra moisture superpowers our storms. As Kevin Trenberth of NOAA put it, when that moisture gets caught up in a storm, it invigorates the storm, so the storm itself changes. We get a look at the sense of the results by looking at recent huge floods from Pakistan, where 20 million were dislocated in 2010, to Metro Manila, which was submerged this summer. Munich Re, the world's largest insurance company, the part of our economy that we ask to analyze risk, reported in 2010 that the number of loss-related floods have more than tripled since 1980 and that, quote, the rise cannot be explained without global warming. Point five, fossil fuel is a risk to agriculture. Once fossil fuel increased yields, but now global warming is a killer for agriculture, as a remarkable study in Nature in 2009 demonstrated. The study from researchers at Stanford and the University of Washington found that we are increasingly taking our main grain crops out of the range where they thrive and that we can expect grain yields to fall at least 20 to 40 percent as temperatures rise this century. Real world results bear out the research. Europe's record heat wave in 2003 cut corn yields 36 percent and wheat 21 percent. This summer's heat in the U.S. and Central Europe depleted grain stocks and caused prices to surge 40%. In October 2012, the charity Save the Children reported 24% of families in India and 27% in Nigeria were now scheduling food-free days. This planet ate more than it grew in six of the last 11 years. Point six, fossil fuel is a risk to other species. In 2006, the Nobel-winning Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said the risk from extinctions from climate change could run as high as 70% of species. In January of this year, a new study in the proceedings of the Royal Society found that researchers may in fact have underestimated that risk. Extinction of population of frogs, butterflies, ocean corals, and polar birds to climate change have already been observed. As the National Geographic put it, no matter where they look, scientists are finding that global warming is already killing species and at a much faster rate than had originally been predicted. Point seven, fossil fuel is a risk to coastal cities. In the wake of Sandy, we may feel this more acutely. Its storm surge came on top of seas that had already risen a foot. Unless we slow global warming, that will be at least three times higher by century's end and perhaps much more. A report this morning showed that despite the best efforts of the North Carolina legislature to outlaw sea level rise, the rate here and along the eastern seaboard was actually accelerating among the fastest in the world. This obviously makes coastal storms more dangerous. J. Marshall Shepard, president of the American Meteorological Society, said last Wednesday, as sea level rises, whenever we get even a garden variety storm now, we're going to see more damage. New York is only 17th on the list of most vulnerable cities in this world. Calcutta, Mumbai, Dhaka, top the list. Point eight, it is a risk to forests. In Westerly et al. Science 2006 found that seven times more forested land now burned annually in the U.S. and that the fire season was two and a half months longer on average because it's hotter and drier. Point nine, it is a grave risk to public health. 
The Dara Group, September 2012, reports that global warming accounts for 400,000 deaths annually now, and that air pollution from all fossil fuels kills 4.5 million annually. That builds on a 2009 study from the Global Humanitarian Forum, finding that global warming killed 300,000 annually, and that by 2030 would be the biggest humanitarian challenge the planet faces, sickening at least 310 million people. These may be underestimates. The World Bank in 2011 found that air pollution in China alone was causing 400,000 premature deaths a year. Point 10, fossil fuel is a risk to economies and development. A report commissioned by 20 of the world's poorest countries and released five weeks ago found that global warming was already wiping out 1.6% of the world's GDP, that by 2030 that number would double to 3.2%, and that in the least developed countries the toll was much higher, 11% of GDP. Earlier studies show much the same. Lord Stern in England demonstrated as early as 2006 that the damage to global GDP over the century could range as high as 20%. We can see it empirically in a study by Olkin and MIT in 2012, which found that over the last 50 years, every degree of temperature increase in a country reduced economic growth 1.3%. 11, it is a risk to national security. During the Bush administration, a secret Pentagon report found that as the planet warmed, it would lead to greater conflict and that, quote, warfare could come to define human life, unquote. The Obama Pentagon has been more open. The National Defense University conducted exercises about climate change in 2009, and subsequently a variety of military analysts, experts at the Pentagon, and intelligence agencies told the New York Times that, quote, climate-induced crises could topple governments, feed terrorist movements, and destabilize entire regions. Point 12, it is a risk to political freedom and liberty. The further we let climate change get out of hand, the more onerous the response is likely to be. Brent Rinaldi, writing in August of this year, said, climate change is a conservative's nightmare because under pressure from climate stress, even the most robust constitutional democracy may find its character threatened. Faced with more severe or frequent floods, people will become more accustomed to looking to central authorities for aid and direction. As Matt Brunig pointed out in 2011, it is a deep philosophical problem for libertarians because the consequences of climate change include, quote, damage to the property of others all over the world. Point 13, in honor of election day, fossil fuel is a risk to our democracies. Ads from this particular industry have dominated campaign spending this year, according to the New York Times in September. Fossil fuel billionaires David and Charles Koch may spend $100 million on this election. Two weeks ago, Chevron made the largest corporate donation since Citizens United to a right-wing super PAC. One result of these payoffs is that fossil fuel gets $409 billion a year globally in subsidies, six and a half times as much as clean energy. I'll return with the better news in a few minutes, that we have the tools we need in order to adapt. Right now, we'll get to hear what Alex has to say. Thank you. Mr. Epstein? All right. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Okay, so um, Bill asked me to list my points. It's going to be a shorter list. I have basically one point, which is that fossil fuels are absolutely essential to make this planet a better place to live. Fossil fuels are absolutely essential to make this planet a better place to live. Now, it's not that I don't have opinions and uh, dissenting opinions on, I think it was the 13 issues uh, that Bill raised. Um, but most debates that I see on this issue are really problematic because one person gives 13 assertions and then the other person gives 13 assertions and none of you have the evidence and we all know that things can get taken out of context. So it ultimately just boils down to which authority do you trust, who seems like the nicer guy, uh, what political party are you affiliated with and I, I just don't think that works. But then the question is how do we know what's right. And I think the best way, at least in my experience thinking about this issue, is to try to find statistics about the big picture. And the big picture for me is what makes human life on this planet better? Now, Bill has asserted that this, there's this 
all of these dangers, and it's overwhelming. And, and you hear one after the other after the other, and it's, um, it's daunting. And you think, OK, well, there are so many of them. It, it must be true. And the way I think about it is this. What, what question can I ask to really get clarity on this issue? And the question I would ask about everything that Bill said is, OK, if this is true, if this is true, how bad has the climate gotten? Is there any way we can really measure how bad a place the planet has become for human beings? Uh, Bill has been at this since 1989, um, since this issue has been really prominent since 1988. Since then, they've, we've been told the planet is getting worse and worse and worse. There are all these dangers. People are dying. And so the question is, is there any way to measure that? Uh, so I would ask you, just based on what you've heard uh, from Bill and others, if you had to put a number on it, what would be your guess as to how much dan more dangerous the planet is becoming, over the, you know, especially over the past couple decades, as we've used massive amounts of fossil fuels? Um, and we actually happen to have a number for this. And it's a number you can corroborate easily. And it's called climate danger, conveniently enough. It measures how dangerous the climate is. And the way it does this is by tallying the number of climate-related deaths. So think about over the past couple decades, how much would you expect climate-related deaths to go up, um, you know, given that we've heard so much? Would it be 10%, 50%, 100%? Just, just, I'm not going to poll people, but just think of a number in your head. So I'm going to show you something that changed the way I thought about this issue forever. So you're going to see one line, which is black, which is CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. And the other line is blue, which is climate-related deaths to the present. So what's going on? As CO2 emissions go up, climate-related deaths plummet. They don't even go up a little bit. They completely plummet. And yet we've been hearing about these apocalyptic scenarios for so long. So what's going on here? Well, unfortunately, I think Bill um, is getting a lot of the facts about global warming wrong. And in two major ways. One is that he's mixing two very, very different things. One is what are the known facts about global warming? What are the proven scientific facts? And then what is speculation? What is more on the frontier? What's, what's more unknown? Because when you're dealing with speculation, there are always a million different opinions. And you have to know that if, if any of you have, all, I'm sure many of you have done research, you know in every field there are different opinions. So it's not fair to just cherry pick one and say, this is certain, especially since neither of us are specialized scientists. So we have to acknowledge what's proven science and what uh, isn't. And part of the reason that the climate-related deaths have gone down is because the proven science shows that the warming to date is very non-dramatic. For example, from 1870 to 1940, where there were not many CO2 emissions, the global temperature increased by half a degree. Uh, from 1940 to the present, the temperature increased by half a degree, including essentially no warming in the last 15 years. And all of the major models including the ones uh, Bill relies on in his Do the Math campaign, completely failed uh, to predict this. So I'll get into some of the other stuff later. I'll talk about the Arctic and the oceans and, and those things. But for now, I just want to plant in your head, it's obviously not getting, there's obviously not a trend toward objective danger to human life. This isn't demonstrated at all in the data. So part of it is the climate isn't getting bad in this profound way. But the more, there's a more important thing, because you can't explain uh, the decline. And the decline, by the way, is 98% since the 20s. You can't explain such a decline uh, just by the climate. What you can explain it by is technology. Technology is really what makes the climate safer. And the big revelation I got from this graph is that really technology, technological protection from the climate matters far more than what your climate happens to be. And that's going to be a big point. 
and the connection with that and fossil fuels is that a, um, a technological civilization that can protect us against these things. So for example, we can drain swamps and use synthetic compounds uh, to completely eradicate malaria. Malaria is supposedly caused by global warming. Well, we used to have it when it was cooler and we eradicated it using technologies. Um, you can, uh, with drought, we hear about drought problems. Drought-related deaths have gone down by 99.98% thanks to modern agriculture, which is by no means finished, uh, powered by fossil fuels, including the ability to transport crops uh, from one place to another. So in California, in the old days when we had a drought, I mean, way before I was there, it could have been I died. Now, it means that my strawberries go up in price. That's how much better technology makes life. So we can't talk about climate and how much, you know, whether it's getting better or worse, whether it's dangerous or not, without reference to technology. And then the thing that underlies all of technology, which is affordable, abundant energy. And fossil fuels are the leading source of affordable, abundant energy. They supply 85% of the world's energy. So they supply the energy that's lifted billions of people out of poverty in Asia. They supply the energy that makes our agricultural uh, system possible. And they are absolutely vital for the fact that we have the safest climate in history. Now, it's important to recognize that there are two risks we're talking about in tonight's debate. One is the risks of using fossil fuels, but the other and which is the one I think is by far the greater risk, is the risk of not using fossil fuels. This is not just an academic debate over you know, tallying risks as an end in itself. Ultimately, this is about what do we actually do? What do we actually do to the fossil fuel industry? What do we actually do to our energy prices? And it matters a lot. And, and um, Bill, as his solution in his book, Earth, said, um, I'll just make sure to quote this so I get it, accurately, um, quote, we need to cut our fossil fuel by a fa use by a factor of 20 over the next few decades. So a factor of 20. This is by far the most important source of energy in the world. Just to give you an indication, it produces 85%. Solar and wind, which Bill favors, produce a very expensive 0.3%. Solar and wind have never replaced one fossil fuel plant in all of subsidized solar and winds history. In Germany, which uh, Bill has cited as the leading exponent of solar, which is true, Germany not only has not replaced a coal plant, they're building at least a dozen new ones because the Germans need real energy and the world needs real energy. And there are two billion people in the world, who, almost, who don't even have electricity. And what they need to have a better climate is not some sort of static climate which never existed. What they need is plentiful energy and technology. And the only way they're going to get it is with more fossil fuels. So that kid who's heating up in India in a heat wave, he needs an air conditioner, and he needs it now. And so to even talk about restricting 20% of fossil fuels is bad, to talk about 95% of the thing the whole world needs, I don't know a word other than suicide. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Dr. McKibben. Let me begin by saying I'm not actually a doctor. Uh, well, sort of. I have like a number of honorary degrees, but that's it. Um, um, I wouldn't want any inaccuracy here. Um, okay. I, I confess that I'm a little flummoxed by exactly how to proceed. Um, since uh, it strikes me that at this point, the, the putative debate about whether or not fossil fuel represents a risk to the planet is more or less uh, over. There's been no answer at all to the long series of very powerful, not just risks, but certainties that I outlined. Uh, it's not a matter of opinion or divided evidence or something like that about whether the Arctic has melted or not. Uh, more than half of it by area and 75% by volume is now missing. Uh, it's not a matter of opinion about whether the number of 
floods and deluges has increased dramatically. I give you both scientific evidence and evidence from the insurance company. Uh, it's not a sort of divided sense of whether or not grain yields are going down as heat rises. I showed you case after case after case, on and on, with all the other risks that I described. And I'll return to them at the end, but let's go, since the point of a debate putatively is to have a little bit of clash, let's go to the points that Alex was making. Um, in fact, he offered one piece of evidence without source or date, something about uh, decline in number of deaths over the last century. You'll recall that I began by saying that in the past, fossil fuel has been a boon, and now it represents a tremendous risk. Let's try and see if we can figure out whether or not there's some correlation at this point between fossil fuel and things like longevity. Um, uh, even if there was, it would be a correlation, not a cause. But uh, uh, the, um, the um, World Health Organization, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Center for Disease Control published recently a list of the 10 reasons that, long, that uh, uh, mortality has declined in this country over the last century, and they have very little to do with fossil fuel. They have to do with vaccination, motor vehicle safety, safer workplaces, decline in deaths from coronary disease, safer and healthier foods, and healthier mothers and babies, and the fluoridation of drinking water. Uh, they go on to say, and this is recent research from Kaiser Permanente, that if we want, uh, at the moment in parts of this country, longevity as life expectancy has actually begun to reverse and go down. Kaiser Permanente, the big health care concern, said earlier this year in May, in fact, that if we wanted to reverse that trend and become healthier, one way to do it, an important way, would be to use less fossil fuel. More biking and more walking would both be important parts of that response. Let's look at rankings around the world, and you begin to get a sense of what nonsense it is to try and correlate these things. Uh, the highest life expectancies in the world are all in countries that use half or less, half as much energy or less than the United States. Japan is, uses less than half the amount of energy per person as the United States. Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Sweden, Norway, Austria, Netherlands, Belgium, Greece, Cyprus, Ireland, Finland. These are all at half our level, and they all have uh, of energy use, and they all have longer life expectancies. You find the same thing within the United States. The top six states in terms of of life expectancy, Hawaii, Minnesota, California, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, five of them are in the bottom of per capita use. You find the same thing when, of energy use. You find the same thing when you look around the world. Go to a country, a country like India uh, that Alex described and, and look at the by province by province. Kerala in southern India, a province of 30 million people, has by far the best life expectancy in India. It has about 10 years above the Indian average, and yet they use only 60% of the Indian average of fossil fuel. You find the same kind of thing when you rank almost anything else, uh, country by country or state by state. Uh, 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 education in this country, the top 10 states are all in the bottom half of energy use. The worst are places like Mississippi, West Virginia, Louisiana, and Alabama, which are all among the top 10 energy users. The cleanest countries in the world are countries like Switzerland, uh, or 14 of the top 20 are in Europe, and they use half as much energy as the United States. Uh, the U.S. has failed to keep pace. It now is 39th on that list. That statistic comes from that radical magazine, Forbes. Um, moving on, let's talk about whether or not it's um, 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 whether or not there's some chance that we might find something else to do uh, other than burn rocks in order to keep this thing going that we call civilization. Since I've made an unrefuted case that it's going to destroy us if we keep doing what we're doing, that the oceans will rise, uh, 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 that the forests will burn, that all the other things I described will take place, it will come as good news to you to find out that in fact there is a workable alternative to First of these, and I'll call it point 14, 13, I guess, since I'm trying to keep in track here. Uh, 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 
Point 14, increasing energy and conservation can be highly effective. As early as 2009, the Wall Street consulting firm McKinsey and Company identified ways to save 23% of American energy use by 2020 at a cost, no, not at a cost, at a savings of $1.2 trillion. The International Energy Agency in September of this year, i.e. five weeks ago, said global transport could easily be 50% more efficient by 2050. The IEA has also identified ways to reduce the planet's energy demand by a third by mid-century with more efficient buildings. As you reduce demand, the chances of meeting more of it with renewable energy improve because point 15, renewables really work. There's nothing speculative anymore about them. In fact, and again, this is why it's important to listen to dates and to evidence, there's a report this morning from the German minister, energy minister, Stephen Kohler, who works, of course, in the conservative government of Angela Merkel, that the country will easily beat even its own ambitious plans for renewable energy and generate more than half the country's power that way by 2025, and perhaps as high as two-thirds. Already this year, there have been days when more than half the power came from solar panels within its borders. Germany is the one country that's taken this seriously, the one, the one non-Scandinavian country that's taken this seriously. It's not simple what they're doing. It's requiring all kinds of innovation to deal with everything from the intermittency of renewable energy to grid integration. But as the energy minister, Mr. Kohler, said last Thursday, I think we can integrate it. It's also not free, it takes money. Energy prices have gone up enough that 800,000 Germans out of 81 million are having trouble paying their electric bills. But the good news is that renewable energy is becoming steadily cheaper. Bloomberg, September 2012, prices for solar panels have fallen 75% in the past three years. Um, right now, the the thing to understand, the thing to, to, to be excited about, is that we're actually on the edge of a moment when we get to make the transition to something else. Everybody knows that 50 or 100 years from now, we're going to power our lives with the sun and the wind. That's what's coming. The question is, can we make that transition fast enough to avoid the worst of the effects that I've described? Clearly that's our challenge, and clearly we're capable of doing it if we don't listen to the kind of voices of defeat. One of the things that kind of um, seems ironic to me about this debate is that Alex speaks for the Center for Industrial Progress, and yet he seems so, um, so sure that our engineers and scientists aren't up to the challenge of creating a new world where we power ourselves in new and profoundly interesting ways. In fact, this kind of energy is soaring every place, including in the developing world. The Chinese are now the fastest growing users of renewable energy on Earth, and they're increasing at a very rapid rate. The only place this has not happened in huge quantities or the most laggard place is the United States. And the reason for that is not technology. We're inventing most of this stuff. The reason for that is politics. I described it earlier on and it went unrefuted, the iron grip that the fossil fuel industry has on our political system. That has been enough to keep us from making those transitions. And it's why we need to stand up to that industry soon, sooner rather than later, in order to make this transition possible. Um, I almost feel kind of bad that Alex didn't do anything to sort of cheer us up at all. I was hoping that there'd be some response to the litany of uh, true trouble that's coming at us, the biggest problem that the world has ever faced. Um, the only good news that you've heard tonight is that there's a good possibility that if we set our minds to it, our minds will be capable of meeting this challenge. Thank you. First of all, uh, Bill, for your records, historical statistics of the world economy by Angus Madison. What date? 2008, I believe. OK, so I want to talk about uh, two issues, broadly speaking. One, um, actually three. One is what Bill's policy is. Two is the need for energy. And three is 
the need for context when we discuss very, very complex issues. Um, so I said before, Bill says in the ne next couple decades, we need to reduce fossil fuel use by 95%. And I just want to make that concrete. That means using any, whether he does it through a carbon tax or however, cap, whatever he wants, that means that using any more than 5% of the fossil fuel ener energy we use today should be illegal. That's the only way of making sure that that happens. Uh, illegal. And I, I want to put that in the context of Germany. So I'll we'll use Germany as a running example. So if every country in the world were to use the same amount of energy as Germany, we would need three times more energy. Three times more energy. Uh, now, I'm very optimistic that that can be met. But when I look at how that can be met, what I, what I look at most of all is the evidence. What has actually been proven? So if you're, say, some of you want to become venture capitalists, if you were a venture capitalist and every time someone came to you with a study that said, oh, I can produce 50% of your energy for, for no money, or I've got a study that says this, you would go out of business. And what you look for with anything is, is a track record. So the fact that someone has a study or an idea or something else uh, doesn't prove anything. So with the case of different sources of energy, we have to look at what are the most promising sources of energy. Because it's, it's so important. I mean, even to just take, uh, take a place like Asia. If we look at, if we look at in China, what, what the difference, um, the places that use a lot of fossil fuels versus the little fossil fuels, you have like a seven year different life expectancy between rural and urban China. And um, I don't have the quote here, but there's, uh, I remember reading a quote from a woman who had gone from rural to urban, and she talks about how when she was in rural, because it was, it was all manual labor, you know, she was just, they would lie up at night hungry, getting bitten by mosquitoes, and they couldn't do anything about it. Now, imagine the, the positive possibility of getting out of that, of getting a job at a factory where with machines and with energy you can be a lot more productive. You, you'd get a decent paycheck. Now, maybe not one we would want, but one that would allow them to buy their first light bulb or buy their first refrigerator. This is the story of what is actually happening in the world. This is amazing stuff. Fossil fuels are growing rapidly, and lives are getting better and better and better. And I definitely stand by my choice to focus on that one statistic, because it is a big picture statistic, and it is a statistic that deals with what is actually proven in reality. If we think about the climate system is this enormous uh, system, and then the human system is this enormous system. It's very, very hard to know what overall is going to benefit and what is going to harm it. So a big picture statistic is the best. And the fact that despite 25 years of apocalyptic uh, predictions, that life is getting better and better, that casts into doubt the case that it's going to get worse. Um, that case is entirely based on models. And most of these studies are based on models. Now, there's nothing wrong with models, but if you've ever done uh, computer modeling or even just familiar with it, modeling is very difficult. And the more complex the system, the more difficult the modeling. So if you're taking something like the climate, which is probably the most incredibly complex thing I can imagine, my assumption is that there's no way, it, a blind assumption, I've investigated it, but would be there's no way they're going to possibly model that in a meaningful way. It's just, it's so hard. And particularly the idea that, well, it's CO2, that CO2 going from 0.03% of the atmosphere to 0.04% of the atmosphere. Now, there is a greenhouse effect, which is a fairly mild effect on its own. But it's the idea that they can model that and predict the climate seems very implausible. But fortunately, uh, I don't need to just assert that and say that I found a study about that, because I can show you the reality of it. And this brings me to. Um, Bill, one of Bill's mentors, Dr. James Hansen. And one of these things with climate predictions is they're making predictions 10, 20, 30 years out. So we need to generally look at what were, you know, what were the older predictions and how did they turn out. Now, Hansen made a prediction that pertained to what's going to happen um, if we use X amount of fossil fuels. And one is what happens if we stop in 2000. 
One happens if, if it was a fixed rate. One happens if it was a point, uh, 1.5 increase a year. And what it turned out was he had these very, very dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, graphs. And you know, this is how far it was supposed to go up if we use this much fossil fuels. Well, it turned out we used this much fossil fuels, and yet the temperature went here. So this model didn't predict it. And it's nothing against Hansen. It's a very, very difficult job. Um, and this, this is true of all the other models. I mentioned they didn't uh, predict the recent complete, almost complete flattening of temperature. And so the basic fact, the fact based on, on evidence, not based on someone's future speculation, but based on evidence, is that the climate models cannot predict climate. So what we have to go by is the actual evidence about climate. And what Bill is asserting, what all these studies are asserting, is that a half a degree warming in the last 70 years, which is the same as the half a degree warming before that, which is, has to be entirely due to non-human causes, that that is somehow causing a worldwide catastrophe where we need to ban 95% of our most practical source of energy. And I want to point out that, and, and again, we need three times more energy for everyone to get to the level of Germany. So it's not enough to cite an energy efficiency study or talk vaguely about the potential of renewables or cite one uh, German example, which I want to talk about. You have to look at the big picture. And the big picture is Bill's policy is going to starve the world of energy. The people, the people who have been, their lives have been getting better, they're not going to be able to afford energy. Uh, the people who, in, say, Africans who aspire, um, you know, who aspire to a better life, they're at the margin. They need energy as cheaply as possible. And what that means is coal, um, oil, and natural gas, particularly in the developing world, coal. So those are the facts. We know that nation after nation, from China to India to Indonesia, has revolutionized and is in the process of revolutionizing its ability um, using ability to live using fossil fuels. It's a now, so it's that is that is the big picture, and it is a stark big picture. So if someone talks about banning 95 percent of our of our most affordable source of energy, he's saying that practical energy should be practically illegal. Now, in the last couple minutes, what I want to say is just a little bit on context. Um, so Bill talked about his unrefuted things and that I had no refutation at all. Um, I have refutations for just about all of those, but you got, he's given you no real evidence except citing studies, and there are a million counter studies. You can look it up on the web if you Google anything he does. And if you Google McKibben in those topics, you'll find dozens of real scientists blasting him, and that doesn't prove anything either. What proves anything is the evidence. But what I want to draw your attention to is that unfortunately Bill is misrepresenting evidence clearly. And one is this claim of the oceans becoming acid. So in chemistry class, we have a table right here, right? a pH table. So the oceans, this claim is based on the oceans, by some aggregate measurement, went from an 8.2 to an 8.1. So acid is down here, basic. So what they did is they become slightly less basic, or if you want to put it another way, they became slightly more neutral. But to call them acid, that's just for effect. That's just to scare you. That's not, that's not legitimate. Um, I'll have more about taking things out of context, but one, I'll just take Germany since energy is my, my area of expertise. Um, Germany uses all sorts of accounting tricks that make the worst uh, accounting at Enron look, look good by comparison. Basically what they do with solar and wind very quickly is because these are unreliable sources of energy, sometimes you get too little, sometimes you get too much. When you get too much, you have to pawn it off to the other grid. And that only works if the other grid has excess capacity to pawn it off. But when Germany is giving these numbers, what they do, so usually these numbers are always doubled. What they do is they, they count all of the energy they produced as energy, even though they only consumed half of it. And that's the big picture is that we need fossil fuels to live, but I just want to point out it's very easy to take stuff out of context, and unfortunately, Bill is doing us a disservice by doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Lady, yes, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have uh, the opportunity for the two participants to cross-examine each other. Uh, each By agreement, the two participants have, have agreed that uh, they will each have two minutes. 
Uh, after the cross-examination, we will go into a period of uh, two sets of rebuttals. But uh, Mr. Epstein, you may start first. You have two minutes. Good question. Um, okay, Bill, you mentioned excitement about the future of energy, and, and two technologies I think are particularly exciting that don't emit CO2 are hydroelectric and nuclear. Now, unfortunately, the movement that you're part of, the environmentalist movement, is the biggest uh, movement for shutting down dams, and the biggest movement for opposing nuclear power. And I know you say nuclear power is expensive, but it actually was very cheap in the 70s before that movement made it expensive. So I'm curious, why don't, no, here's the question. Will you come out and champion nuclear power given that it is the only, the one CO2 free source of power that can scale worldwide? A, environmentalists are not opposed to all dams. Some of us are working hard, say, in my community in Vermont to build new dams and turbines on rivers. Second, nuclear power, we have no idea whether or not it's uh, going to play a role until we have a serious price on energy. Once we, I mean, at the moment, remember the fact that uh, alone among industries, the fossil fuel industry gets to put out its waste for free. That explains the tremendous market failure we see around us. M my guess is that fossil fuel will play, I mean, that nuclear power will play next to no role going forward simply because it's too expensive to, uh, and, and it's not me who says this, and Jeffrey Immelt, the, ch the chairman of GE, uh, said this summer, and this is a company with a large nuclear exposure, said it's just too expensive going forward. Wind and things are doing things much more cheaply now, so nuclear power is not where the future lies. Yeah, I completely uh, disagree with that. It's, it's a non-intermittent source, so we know that it can... So the good news about intermittency is that we're learning all kinds of ways to deal with it. Uh, and, and this is what's exciting about as we go into these new technologies. It's exactly what engineers are doing all over the place. I can show you a list of the five new technologies dealing precisely with the intermittency of wind and sun. All the ways that we're figuring out how to integrate them into grids, how to make them work. Mr. McKibben, thank you very much. Now, Mr. McKibben, you have two minutes, two minutes. to cross-examine. Absolutely. Discussion. You were saying that I'd provided no real evidence of anything. Um, um, do you have any reason to think that the uh, Arctic hasn't melted? Yeah, I have a quote about that I wanted to mention later. So when you talk about the issue of, you often use the terminology of unprecedented. So with things like the Arctic, sometimes we only have a couple decades worth of satellite data. So there's a great quote in the 1920s talking about how they're going up to the Arctic, the Arctic is receding. So you, you, your, your sense change. is that the Arctic had melted in the no. 1920s. Okay. okay so, Do so you have any... Wait, wait, can I continue answering that? Also, there's the issue of my focus here is not is there no changing in the world at all? I don't believe that the planet is somehow inherently perfect. I think actually we need to perfect the planet for human life. And so what that means is that if you're in a general warming trend, which was started naturally in the 1800s, it's not that surprising that more ice would melt. I think it's very misrepresentative, and I don't think it's fair to call it breaking uh, the Arctic. And if you cite a bunch of studies based on climate prediction models that can't predict climate, I'm not convinced. I see. Um, do you have some reason to think that the, uh, uh, that the rate of deluge and extreme rainfall hasn't increased 20% in? in yeah, I mean, this years? is a very hotly disputed issue in terms of. Well, if it's hotly disputed, don't you have to give us some evidence of well, that? You're, you're a, so you're, a, no, no, you, you, you're, you're giving no specific evidence. You're making an I assertion. Can't. So Let's let him finish. Please. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. So, I mean, for instance, Richard Lindzen of MIT, among many others, have theories about how, um, you know, a general warming will lessen the temperature differences. Does Dr. Lindzen have any reason to think that, that, that deluge hasn't gone up 20%? Okay. Could you please let it? Well, he's filibustering here. <laughs> Mr. Epstein, Mr. Epstein, you have 15 seconds to complete Yeah, so anyway, um, just to try to explain it, um, the difference between the equator and the pole will lead to less... Um, less severe storms. That's a general theory. What you're giving is an oversimplification to an audience who doesn't know the data, doesn't know the disagreements, and it's unfair. You're not okay. a scientist, and you shouldn't do that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we now have, go into the rebuttal phase of the uh, debate. Uh, each of the uh, participants will have five minutes each on uh, two sets of rebuttals. Uh, Mr. Epstein, you please go first. All right. 
So let's, I want to talk about one, one issue which you can look up and I think validate easily, which, which shows the severity of, I think, what Bill is proposing. And again, I, I can't let this go. The whole reason that I called for this debate is that Bill McKibben said that fossil fuels should be virtually illegal. And I believe that that would ruin my life, that it would ruin your life, and that it would ruin billions of lives around the world. And the only reason I believe that is because I believe in the power of energy. And from everything I know, fossil fuel energy happens to be the most important at this point in time. Now, my prediction is definitely that sometime in the future, nuclear energy, for various technical reasons, will predominate. But that's many decades away. So I might prefer nuclear. It doesn't really matter what I prefer. What matters is what people can produce now and what people need now. And the number one thing we need in life is food. And here's the facts about food. The world today has 7 billion people, and they're basically better fed than any world population in history. But this is a precarious thing, not because um, modern agriculture is inherently precarious, but because without fossil fuels, this whole system would collapse. Fossil fuels are something as good, this whole system would collapse. In the 1970s, in 1970, just to give you a point of comparison, um, many people were forecasting that with a population of about 3.8 billion people, hundreds of millions of people would starve. There was just this problem of world hunger. What are we going to do about it? You know, people are going to die. And what, what solved the problem of world hunger? Well, it was a combination of genetic engineering and fossil fuels. In particular, what you had is oil-powered machinery made agriculture much more productive, so you could have a harvester that could, uh, that could um, reap like the equivalent of 500,000 loaves of bread a day. And at the same time, you had oil-based transportation that, as I mentioned before, could take crops from, you know, that could take crops to areas that are suffering. You also had a lot more farmland that was in circulation because with transportation, you know, someone could grow something one place and transport it 3,000 miles away, even if there wasn't nearly the local uh, demand. And then there was fertilizer produced by natural gas. Now, there's no question at all, leaving aside someone making up that they have a solution to doing this without fossil fuels, We've had 10,000 years of trying to do agriculture without fossil fuels and, or something just as good. And what we had was periodic starvation and famine and suffering over and over and over. And only once we figured out how to create abundant, affordable energy and devote it to producing crops, only then did, could people live in large numbers and not be uh, afraid of, of starving. So when Bill talks about, like, in vague terms, exciting uh, new technologies. It's certainly an industry I follow a lot. There's no solar or wind replacement for a combine harvester. I mean, these aren't, again, these are not, there's nothing proven about these at all. They, they're, always, they're, always the tech, they're always the next technology. I mean, they've been around for at least 75 years apiece. There's always great studies about how they're going to be the future. But in reality, they're not going to feed people. So what we need, what the world needs, is more fossil fuels. The evidence we have is not just that fossil fuels aren't ruining our planet. They're making it much better. Climate-related deaths are going down. And so what we need is many, many more fossil fuels so that people can eat and they can have food. So if, if Bill McKibben came here tonight and cited a bunch of studies and said, my conclusion is we should ban 95% of food, you would say that's crazy. But he's saying we should ban 95% of fossil fuels, which is the food of food. Without fossil fuels, we, simply billions of people will starve. There is no evidence to the contrary. And so to cavalierly talk about that is, is just is really, uh, I, I won't end that sentence, but I think it's really, really irresponsible. Because you've got, again, these are, real, these are real lives. These are people who, if we do the wrong thing, they will die. And ultimately, you, know, you will suffer too, but these people will die. And one thing we know is that modern industrial fossil fuel agriculture saves billions of lives. And I, what Bill is saying would take them away.
let's return here to where we began with my very first point, which was that in the past, fossil fuel has been a boon, and now it represents a risk. The risks, in fact, they're more than risks, they're certainties, as outlined in one piece of evidence after another, are unrefuted. So let's think about what we're going to do going into the future. Um, I was glad that we finally got down to some brass tacks here. Alex said one thing we need in life is food, that we're better fed than any population in history, uh, and that that's precarious because of the lack of fossil, because of someone might want to take away fossil fuel. In fact, as I pointed out, it's precarious because we're having very strange weather. Six of the last 11 years, without any restriction on fossil fuel, we've eaten more than we've grown on this planet. The good news is that we're figuring out other ways, as usual, to do these things. Technology marches forward, and technology is not always high tech. Often it uh, feels like lower tech to us. People learning how to use new techniques in remarkably efficient ways. My last book, Deep Economy, or last book, Earth, had a, a, a long list of the really exciting research uh, showing that grain yields and other yields of crops are actually doing very well. Let me update some of that. Um, um, I'm looking here at data from uh, 2012. Uh, recent, study, um, uh, recent studies from Switzerland with 154 growing seasons worth of data on various crops grown on rain-fed and irrigated land in the US and elsewhere found that organic yields were essentially equal at this point to uh, uh, yields from conventional farming. Now, it takes more people doing it. We're not going to be able to get by with 1% of Americans on the farm, which is what we have now, i.e., half as many people as we have in prison. We will not need to go back to 50% of Americans on the farm like we had a long time ago, but a few percentage more would make it a lot easier. Um, um, the, um, the questions about food have to be thought about in the context that I provided and that no one has refuted in any way. That if we keep doing what we're doing, grain yields are going to fall 20 to 40 percent in the course of the century simply because it's getting too hot. That's what the agronomists tell us. There were two other points, I think, of clash here. One, I was accused of misrepresenting things by talking about ocean acidification. I said that the oceans had become 30% more acid, and that's unrefuted. Um, that doesn't mean that they have turned to acid. It means that they are headed in that direction. It's not me who's saying this. Uh, the head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration said recently that ocean acidification was, in her words, global warming's evil twin, a very serious situation. She likened it to osteoporosis of the oceans because it's thinning the shells of all the creatures at the bottom of the marine food chain. Alex finally cited an actual scientist, albeit in passing without any real reference. He called on Richard Lindzen, who's always been the one scientist that uh, uh, climate deniers and skeptics have talked about. It's worth knowing that though he did good work a long time ago, a long time ago was a long time ago. The New York Times uh, recently talked about the fact that his Theories about clouds and the equator that Alex cited have been widely discredited. Today, most mainstream researchers consider Dr. Lindzen's theory discredited. He, uh, uh, he published a paper in 2009 offering more support for his case, but once again, scientists identified errors, including a failure to account for known inaccuracies in satellite measurements. Dr. Lindzen acknowledged that the 2009 paper contained some stupid mistakes. It was just embarrassing, he said in an interview. The technical details of satellite measurement are really sort of grotesque. Um, 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 this is not cutting edge science, and it does not come close to refuting the almost endless set of citations that I've been giving you all along. If I sound just the tiniest bit uh, disgruntled here, I apologize for it. But it's because I put an enormous amount of work into trying to understand these questions and bring you the evidence that you need. And just to have someone say, oh, well, evidence is crazy, just go Google whatever you want and figure it out, doesn't amount to a debate. It amounts to a kind of capitulation. And uh, uh, 
it is a very hard case to argue in Alex's defense because all you have to do is look at the world around you and see the change that's now happening. Not 100 years ago when fossil fuel was doing us some good, but now when it represents a grave risk. So a little over 10 years ago, uh, I was you. I would have definitely come to this debate. I was very interested in this issue. I was certainly worried um, about this issue. I didn't know much about energy uh, back then. And if I, think, if I, think, I think if I had come here, I would, have been, I would have been really confused by what Bill was saying, because I wouldn't really know what I could trust. And in particular, I wouldn't know what is really a proven fact. What is speculation and what is misrepresentation? And it's, it's very hard to know. And that's why my goal at the beginning was to try to give you the big picture. Uh, Bill mentioned that all we need to do is look around us. And that is exactly, exactly what we do not just need to do. What we need to do is look at the full picture. Look at people in faraway parts of the world. Look at the long term. Look at the trends. And that's why I tried to show you a very dramatic trend that fossil fuels are making the planet a better place to live for human beings. That has gone unrefuted. The aggregate evidence is that the planet is a much better place for human beings. And it's not, and I can explain exactly why. Energy is our capacity to do work, to be productive. The more energy we can use, the farther away we get from manual labor, the more productive we can be, the more wealth we can create, the more we can adapt to the world around us. The reason why the climate is safer, besides the fact that it's not nearly as scary uh, as Bill says, besides the fact that the proven science shows a very mild warming, and it doesn't make sense to attribute every out of context problem you can find to 0.5 degrees Celsius warming in seven years. The basic fact is that technology powered by fossil fuels has made life so much better for so many people. The point that I've made, my, my own frustration, is that I've made the point repeatedly that the reason I'm here is because Bill says that our leading source of energy should be practically illegal. Now, if Bill was a farm entrepreneur who said that he could defy all of history and revolutionize agriculture, Without fossil fuels, I'd say, fantastic, go for it. Like, I, I approve of it, I love new ideas. If Bill said, I have a way of overcoming the fact that it's super, super hard to get energy from the sun and the wind as a standalone source, which it's never really been done on a large scale, it's super, super hard because the sun and the wind are very inconsistent and they're very diluted, but I've found a way to concentrate all that energy cheaply without tons of money on infrastructure, and I found a way to store it really cheaply, which didn't previously exist. If Bill came with that and he could prove it, I would not be debating Bill. I would be writing a story about him as a hero, because heroes are people who actually create things for real people in the world. Um, but it is not at all heroic, it's not at all idealistic to take the energy that people need to take the best most affordable, most abundant source of energy we have, and to call the people who produce it uh, what Bill called public enemy number one, and again, to effectively make it illegal. If fossil fuels are effectively illegal, practical energy is practically illegal. That's what all the evidence says. Anyone can make up stuff about the future. Um, most new ideas that people have about the future are wrong, so the way that you the way that you can prove things is either you can show a very clear trend in the past or you can make a model that actually works. But what Bill is saying goes against all the trends in the past, which is that fossil fuels are absolutely necessary to make our lives better. And he says 100 years ago, that Chinese person who just got their first light bulb, their first refrigerator, that's not 100 years ago, that's today. And with Bill's policy, they would be out uh, doing manual labor right now. You know, if we had if we had followed that that kind of policy. So, what I want you to just think is that there are two risks here: the risks that come with continuing to use fossil fuels, and there there's risks with everything, and then the risks 
of not using fossil fuels, the risks of doing what Bill says, what he still won't own up to, but which he needs to own up to, which is making fossil fuels essentially illegal. And we know that the world we have has been made possible by abundant, affordable energy. We know that we're safer than ever from the climate. We know that all of this will disappear without um, abundant, affordable energy. And we know that doing what Bill does, everything we know says that will be no more affordable. But an energy, which again, I'm sorry to say, is suicide, even if you call it science. All right, we've almost come to the end of this evening's events, and many thanks to all who made it possible. Um, at one point in our history, fossil fuel was a great boon, and that's good to realize. It's, in fact, how I began this debate. At another point in history, it represents an enormous risk. In fact, as I pointed out, and not by providing studies from some person that you're going to go Google and find that it's not true, but providing hard evidence of exactly what's going on, the acidification of the oceans, the melt of the Arctic, the increase in atmospheric moisture leading to catastrophic floods, the huge cuts in yield of uh, 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 our crops as temperatures warm. All you had to do was look at the Midwest this summer and see what happened. The risk to other species, extinction rates of 70%, the risk to coastal cities, uh, uh, the risk to forests as we increase the, uh, the quadruple, the rate of forest fire, the risk to public health, the 400,000 people a year already dying from the effects of climate change, the four and a half million people a year already dying from the effects of fossil fuel, the risk to economies, the 11% the, the, uh, the reductions in GDP forecast for the poorest countries on earth, that's the reason that those governments, unlike Alex, are pressing extremely hard in the UN for deep cuts in emissions. They're the ones who are pushing hardest for it. Alex didn't even talk about the kind of philosophical points that I managed to make in this debate. The fact that there is a great risk to our liberty and our freedom going forward because we run the risk, and in fact it's probably more than a risk, of, of, of really kind of heavy-handed responses to emergencies. Look what happens just in the last week when trouble on that scale arrives. And the risk to democracy that comes from the power of the fossil fuel industry. He said that I had failed to provide any evidence that renewable energy could do any work. In fact, we talked about what was going on in very particular places, that the Germans, under a conservative government, have now said that they'll have between half and two-thirds of their power coming from renewable energy uh, by 2025. That's a remarkable accomplishment. It's especially remarkable when you think about Germany, foggy, Wagnerian. Munich is north of Montreal. Uh, Germany does not have California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Florida to help it bulk up its statistics. We do. Uh, uh, we talked about how this was happening in the developing world as well, that the Chinese are the leading users now of renewable energy around the world, that 25% of Chinese, when they take a shower at night, that the power, that the hot water comes from solar arrays on the roof. Um, technology powered by fossil fuel did make life better. And it is now causing grave problems. So it is up to us in our generation not merely to keep repeating what people have done in the past, but to make the transition to something else. One would think that that's what people engaged in industrial progress would be for, that they would understand the need for innovation, and especially that they would stop protecting an industry that is the only industry that does not have to pay to throw out its waste. If you're wondering at this point how you can help with this process. I hope that you'll join us at 350.org in this fight. All around the country now, we're launching this big campaign. You'll find it at math.350.org. And one of the things it urges is for colleges and universities to divest their stock from fossil fuel companies as once they did from companies implicated in the apartheid regime in South Africa. 
Uh, that's because we need to put pressure on these companies so they stop blocking the path. At some point, they will make the decision to become energy companies. And when they do, they will be a valuable part of this transition. But at the moment, they stand with their money athwart progress. They're the ones trying to keep us addicted to 18th century technology instead of moving forward fast. I make Alex, to the contrary, no claim to be heroic in any way. Um, I don't think that's what this is about. I think it's about the calm, rational, evidence-based discussion of where we are right now. Um, um, and where we are right now is in a world of trouble, but in a world of trouble that we can get out of if we move with real vigor and real dispatch. The next few decades will be a test of just how good an adaptation the big brain really was. I'm confident that if we're not fearful and, 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 and shrink from this challenge, that we can make some real progress. I never said, and this is the last thing I want to say, I never said that any of this was going to be easy. It is not. It is going to be extremely difficult. The only thing more difficult will be trying to survive on the world that I described, the world that's already starting to come into being as a result of fossil fuel. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would now like to take questions. Uh, there's a microphone here in this aisle. If you will please come up to the microphone. Do you want us to stand up here? Uh, yes, please stand up here at the podium and uh, respond to the questions. Uh, we will have time for about six questions. The structure of this part is that you will direct your questions specifically to one of the speakers. Uh, that speaker will have two minutes to respond, and the other speaker will have a minute uh, to, uh, uh, to respond to that. So the first uh, questioner, please state your name and ask and direct your question. Uh, hello, my name is Lucas Spanger. I'm a student in computer science. And um, I'm, my question is for Alex. I'm kind of shocked that you, Bill, did not mention at all that these fossil fuels are finite, like these will run out. How do you respond to the fact that the scenario you, you, you give us with people dying, or like people not, it, cutting down by 95%, all the negatives that you say that will occur, how do you respond to that occurring 300 or 400 years in the future when we use all these finite resources? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. So I just want to make clear that ener so energy is a process. Um, when we talk about what the best kind of energy is, all that means is that it's the best kind of energy. It's the most affordable, abundant right now or for some foreseeable timetable. That's what I'm saying with fossil fuels. For right now and for, let's say, the next couple decades, it's absolutely essential. If you ban it, and, and I'm not saying don't use other things. Of course, go for other things. I love, as I said, I love nuclear. I think it's an amazing technology. But banning is what I'm against. So don't make it illegal to use the best thing at any given time. As long as it's legal to use the best thing at any given time, then what you get is what's called what I call progressive energy, which means you find better and better ways. Um, and I think the evidence is very, very strongly against solar and wind. Uh, I think the only reason those, I have nothing against them personally, I would love, and they're good for things like heating hot water, or solar is anyway, but um, I think the, in general the trend is that the best sources of energy are ones that are really, really condensed, and nuclear power has a million times the energy density of uh, coal. So what's really striking is that the environmentalist movement refuses to come out vigorously in favor. I don't mean I don't mean I don't mean mildly or oh I don't know. I mean this is the only technology in the world that can scale on a world level. And so if you think this is the crisis of a lifetime, Bill, I think right now you should come out and tell the world I support scalable nuclear energy, and I'll, I'm happy to show you the evidence from the 70s if you haven't studied that. And I think if, then you'll learn, then you should really support it. And if you don't, and if you keep letting environmentalists shut down hydroelectric dams, then you don't, then it's not really about CO2. It seems like you're against all the practical sources of energy. You know, I don't know quite how that responds to that question, but I will, I'll try. Um, um, we're not actually gonna run out of fossil fuel in time. Um, we're finding too much as we go around, and enough to destroy the atmosphere or the climate before we run out. 
Uh, if we did run out, we'd actually, we would have long since have moved on to other things and necessity would have been the mother of invention. We're not going to get that easy out this time. We're going to have to decide to do this before things happen. Uh, we're not going to do nuclear power on a large scale simply for no other reason than it's incredibly expensive. It comes obviously with all kinds of other problems too. But the simple disqualifying one, as the head of GE, not me, said this summer, is that it is too expensive when you compete with things like wind. With regulations created by the environmentalist movement. Our next question. My name is Stephen Horton. Um, my question is for Bill. Um, first, I really respect both of you um, for different reasons. And um, one thing I do not respect is a uh, lack of integrity. Um, Bill, I don't know if you understand what, what a logical fallacy is, but many of your arguments tonight were riddled with logical fallacies. And um, most, most of them were akin to if global warming, or since global warming is happening, uh, the number of pirates is decreasing. Or since global warming is happening, the number of strippers is going up. Um, I, I know, I know. But, but you, did, you did make the argument that since global warming is happening, the uh, grain production is decreasing. And I, 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 actually, from, I actually work in sustainable agriculture, so I know a little about that. Yeah, I quoted from agronomists explaining that as the temperature rises, we're taking plants, which after all evolved in the Holocene like us, out of the range at which they really thrive. And we're making it too hot for things to grow at their best. That's why we now think that each in degree increase in global average temperature from this point on should cut grain yields about 10%. That's Battisti and Naylor in Science uh, 2009. Um, yeah, I mean, about agriculture, I think it's, it's just important, again, to take real long-term trends. Um, throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, as modern agriculture was revolutionizing the world, people repeatedly did studies saying, quote-unquote studies saying, this isn't going to work. And I'm really glad we didn't listen to them. But more, the real point is don't take away our freedom. Don't take away our freedom to use the best sources of energy in the name of climate prediction models that don't predict climate or out of context studies. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Jesse Waxman. I'm an environmental science and policy major. Um, my question is for you, Alex. Um, so basically what we've been talking about tonight is a lot of the ethics of fossil fuel use in the grand scale, so global warming, climate change, um, which is great and it's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, but one of the problems with addressing, looking at this from a climate change perspective is that finding the specifics um, case examples can sometimes be difficult. So what I want to ask is something a little more local um, about the ethics of fossil fuel use. Um, when you have, when you're burning fossil fuels, you're releasing VOCs and other toxins into the atmosphere, um, which affects local communities, it affects public health, it affects the economy, um, and fossil fuel use really can't be decoupled from fossil fuel production. Things like mountaintop removal, things like hydraulic fracturing. Um, with mountaintop removal, you have grand increases in cancer rates, in you know, childhood asthma, in a lot of these really bad um, widespread e epidemic diseases um, at the local level. Um, with hydraulic fracturing, you can have um, water contamination, which I realize is debated, but you also have increased VOCs, increased levels of carbon dioxide, which have led to increased um, hospital emissions, increased childhood asthma, increased cardiovascular disease and pulmonary diseases. Um, so my question is, considering the practicality of using fossil fuels, looking at the local level, what are the ethics? Um, and what does, I guess, your side think about the ethics of the localized impacts of fossil fuel use? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a really important issue of, you know, you're, you're trying to get a benefit from a source of energy. And of course, you don't want to do it in a way that violates someone else's rights. So the question is, how do you know when someone's rights are being violated? And part of it is certainly that you have to be really, really objective about the science. So 
Um, looking into many of the studies you mentioned, I, I think some of them have some validity. I think a lot of them uh, do not. For instance, the whole outcry over hydraulic fracturing as a technology contaminating groundwater, uh, I think is, is completely, uh, completely wrong. Now, but part of, the, part of the context is you always want to minimize pollution, but you have to take it in the context of you're minimizing pollution for a purpose, which is so that individuals can lead the, the best lives possible. So for example, when man invented fire, you wouldn't say, oh, you shouldn't be able to use fire because it's getting smoke in your child's lungs. Even though it is getting smoke and you would rather that it not get smoke, the point is that you absolutely need this fire to live. And so the context is it's, you, you can't really consider the smoke pollution. Whereas, say, in a modern context, we can prevent the vast majority of harmful smoke in a cheap way. And therefore, I think that should be defined as pollution. So it's, it's a contextual issue. I would just say overall, based on my reading of the evidence and based on what I talked about tonight, the absolute necessity of this form of energy for the next several decades, um, the, the issue is how to minimize pollution. But the idea of making it illegal due to pollution would be the same as banning fire because of smoke. So one of the reasons that it's been, um, it's been really good to watch communities that have been impacted by fossil fuel come together with people working on climate change and people in affected areas like mountaintop removal areas, it's been good to see that kind of coalition of interest building. And it's because people realize that fossil fuel actually is dirty all along the chain. There's nothing made up about the percentage of kids who come down with asthma when they live near a coal-fired power plant, for instance. As we move forward, one of the virtues of these new technologies that we did not get to talk about much tonight because we were focused on climate change, one of the virtues is that they're cleaner in lots of other ways too. Uh, cleaner and less dangerous. I mean, I have solar panels all over the top of my house. Uh, you know, uh, I suppose theoretically a terrorist could take an interest in them and climb up on my roof and smash them with a hammer. And, and if he did, I, I would have a problem, but it wouldn't be the kind of ramifying crisis that we get. Similarly, you know, um, when we, um, well, when we have a kind of, when we have a solar spill, we sort of call it a sunny day. I mean, um, 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 we're moving in a better direction now. Okay, next question, please. Thank My you. name is Rika, and I wanted to thank you guys for coming out to do this debate tonight. And my question is for Alex. Um, you mentioned that uh, the energy with fossil fuels is a lot more affordable today than renewable energy. And like, obviously that's true, we can see that, but the, the infrastructure and like the development of the technology for the fossil fuels was put in place a long time ago. So that's why it's cheaper today. Is there any evidence that like if it was produced today, or if uh, renewable energy was um, developed already, that it'd still be more expensive than fossil fuels? Uh, yeah, so renewable is kind of a dicey classification because it, it blends together hydroelectric, which is an extremely, extremely practical form of energy and valuable form of energy that, as I mentioned, the environmentalist movement has repeatedly, repeatedly attacked, even though it generates no CO2. So if you go to Sierra Club website, their list of victories includes a list of dams that they shut down. The real issue here, and the thing that Bill is advocating strongly, is, uh, is solar and wind. And the, the basic issues with those don't have to deal um, with the nature of, uh, like some artificial advantage fossil fuels have. The reason is that they're, they're fundamentally intermittent, which means they don't come in in a reliable way. So either you need a backup or a storage system. And the way it works, in basically every case is you have a backup. And the backup is almost always fossil fuels. So if we take Texas, for example, um, they have wind turbines with a very high rating, but they only count on them in, I think, for something like 9% of their electric, 9% of their capacity, I should say. And the rest of the time, what happens is they're backed up by natural gas. I don't know the situation exactly in Vermont, but this is, this is almost always uh, the situation. So what happens is, when the wind is blowing, you can say, oh, we did, you know, you know, we're being green, we got some energy from it. And what happens is, then the get, when you get some wind, the gas cycles down. And then when you don't get wind, the gas cycles up. Well, if you cycle the gas in your car down and up and down and up, we call that stop and go traffic. And do you get more or less fuel efficient in stop and go traffic? You get, 
<laughs> you, get less, you get less fuel efficient. And this is what happens with these things. So usually they don't even save CO2 emissions, which I don't think should be a priority anyway. But it's the fundamental problem is intermittency. And this has been a problem that people have tried to solve for 100 years. Um, but there's, there's no real evidence that it's solved in the way that you can have standalone affordable plants, whereas there is evidence from before, I think, very, very misguided regulations were placed on nuclear by the environmentalist movement. That there's proof of this. There's evidence of this. They produce cheap energy. And so if you care about CO2, your first priority is, is stop attacking nuclear, not you, but uh, get people to stop attacking nuclear, stop attacking hydro, and become champions of them like Thank I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the reason, the reason, and the only reason that uh, fossil fuel is cheaper is because, as I said earlier, it's the only industry in the world that doesn't have to pay to put out its waste. It gets to pour. That's why economists have routinely described climate change as the greatest market failure of all time. There's really no reason not to internalize that externality in the price of fossil fuel. Uh, at which point it would become far, far easier to move in these other directions. The good news is, and here. Um, you know, we have plenty of evidence now uh, that, uh, 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 in fact, we're learning how to cope and easily with some of these intermittency problems for things like wind. Uh, the uh, uh, new data from the UK uh, published within the last six months shows that exactly the opposite of what Alex is saying, that wind is providing huge and real savings in CO2, not causing an increase in emissions from gas-fired power plants. That's what's going on in the real world, and it's going on because we get better at this stuff very fast. And we'd get better at it much faster if there wasn't an artificial monopoly preserved by the fact that the fossil fuel industry doesn't have to pay to put out its waste. That's why we need a movement to challenge them, and that's what we try to do at 350.org. Thank you. Uh, one of the natures of these questions is that they have to be directed to one person. Uh, three of them have, have been directed toward uh, Mr. Epstein. Is there a questioner that has uh, a question uh, for Mr. McKib McKibben? Could you please go ahead next? Uh, my name is David Lewis. Uh, I have a, my question is, um, so you've gone to great lengths to, to try to convince me that uh, wind and solar are, are the future. Mm. Um, you know, the oil industries represent, the oil industry represents, uh, you know, the great market failure. Uh, my question is that, um, f for example, uh, wind, the, uh, windmills, wind technology is not a new technology, it's, it's old. So prior to the oil industry, but prior to that ever, you know, coming about, before all of the government regulations, prior to um, government subsidies to the oil industry, um, you know, people did use windmills. Mm. Um, my question is, why is it that you think that it was the oil industry that won out in the free market rather than all of these windmills, because, you know, as people I said, were using windmills. And, because and, and I said, as I said at the very beginning, there's something quite miraculous about fossil fuel. It's dense in energy, it's relatively easy to get at, it's easy to transport. It's pretty much magic stuff, it's just too bad that it's wrecking the planet. And so what we've now, the reason we're seeing windmills and things resurge now is precisely because we understand that the cost of not doing it is so enormous that we better go in that direction. That's you know, what it means when Lord Stern in the UK says that we face a 20% decline in world GDP if we let the planet warm up. That's what's concentrated people's minds. Um, if we got to the point where we put, now that we know the damage that carbon causes, where we put a price on carbon to reflect that, corrected that market failure, then that switch would happen all the faster. Uh Yes, please. Yes, I, I'd like to address this issue about market failure um, and externalities, which I, I dealt with indirectly, but I just want to connect it uh, directly to what Bill said. So there's this idea that there's this enormous, enormous hidden cost you know, when you buy, say, gasoline at the pump. And so in addition to whatever you pay, you should pay X amount more. But this whole argument is based on the idea that fossil fuels are making our planet so bad 
that we have to make them 95% illegal. In his article in Rolling Stone, Bill said that the tax on fossil fuels should be enough that we need to keep all the carbon we need to in the ground. And his view is that you know, in a couple decades, that means 95% illegal. So who knows what that means, but $100 a gallon, $200 a gallon, that's what he's proposing. And yet what I, what I made clear by the big picture statistics, not focusing on things out of context, not speculative things, but the big picture facts about life, is that fossil fuels have made the planet a better place for you and I and billions of people in the developing world to live. So if anything, I think that you should, that there are, it's the hidden benefits that we're really ignoring about fossil fuels, about affordable energy. So, you know, maybe you should pay them money by that. And I don't think we owe them extra money, but I think the idea that we, have, that we should pay $100 or $200, whatever, for gasoline in the name of a prediction made by climate prediction models that can't predict climate, it would make practical energy, as I said, practically illegal. And it makes no sense. It's not a market failure. It's a thinking failure. Next question, please. Uh, hi, my name is Isaac, and my question is for Alex. Um, Alex, on your website, uh, it states that, uh, quote, so long as we embrace policies that protect property rights, including air and water rights, we protect inv industrial development and protect individuals from pollution. Um, so I'm curious to hear what uh, policies you would propose to protect property rights from uh, the externalities of fossil fuels and how those would measure up in an economic climate where um, the full costs are born. So actually the, the view of, of sort of, there are two, there, I'll try to make this quick. With the pollution issue, kind of externalities and property rights are two different approaches. I, I believe in the property rights approach. And that means that you define something as a violation of a right. And as I mentioned earlier, it has to be in a technological context. You can't say fire should be illegal because it, it produces smoke. Um, so that's, it's, it's an issue of how do you define the rights. And there's a really, really rich tradition that started in the 19th century of people coming up with all sorts of common law to say, OK, you know, if you moved, if you were here first, someone can't move in and say, oh, I have a right to be free from your smoke. But if you were there first, someone can't just move in. And a lot of it is resolved through um, torts and the common law and things like that. So that's, that's my basic belief. And then if you do that, what you have is the best of all worlds, because individuals um, are prevented as much as possible from contaminating one another. And they make these enormous, enormous uh, amounts of progress. And in a place like China or India, there's a lot of progress to be made in that field. What I don't agree with, though, is that the evidence, I don't agree that the evidence shows that CO2 falls in this category. Because again, it's, it's Life is getting better as we emit more CO2. That is just, and in the aggregate, that is, a, that is a fact. Now, I'm not, theor I have no sort of ideological opposition to that ever being true. If it turned out to be true, then we would have to take different measures. But as I said, that would mean liberating nuclear and hydro as soon as possible, liberate solar and wind, and see what happens, but make sure to liberate nuclear and hydro. So the interesting way to think about that question, you know, is say you live in a country like the Maldives, um, which has a 5,000-year-old human population, uh, but its odds of becoming a 5,100-year-old culture are pretty slim because the highest point in the archipelago is about a meter and a half above sea level, and scientists are entirely clear that carbon in the atmosphere is raising the uh, level of the oceans, raising it fast. Um, uh, people in the Maldives have obviously done nothing to cause this problem, their use of fuel is minuscule, and yet their property, literally their property, is being taken away from them by people who are using immense amounts of fossil fuel. It strikes me that, as I said in my speech, that for a libertarian, that strikes a very um, difficult question to answer. Um, um, how it is that we're allowed, uh, uh, because we like to drive around in SUVs, to take uh, 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 their property. The good news is that there's, we don't need to kind of answer it at that level, and we don't need to answer it at a level of a hundred dollar gallon gasoline. What we need to do is go get electric vehicles if we have to use cars at all, and power them from the solar panels on our roof, at which case, not a problem. And you can go down to the GM, Ford, Toyota lot in uh, Durham today and get just that car, and it'll work fine. Did you, is this on? 
You, did you want us to answer questions or just ask them? Because I can, I can answer the question just, of the no, libertarian, no, just libertarian ask, position. Ask, I think. <laughs> you can ask questions. Okay. Um, you, can, so, you can answer them afterwards. Okay, okay. Because I have an answer to the libertarian question. But um, it, it seems like this debate of wind and solar versus fossil fuels is, has been prominent for a long time. And as a free society, our society has chosen fossil fuels for the most part. And in places where they're prohibited, such as like when hurricanes come, like in New York or, or New Jersey, it's chaos without them. And I think that, I think Alex has a, a great point when he says it's food for food, but it's also food for heat, it's food for cars, it's food for everything we do. So, and when we don't have those things, it is chaos. So what would you propose to, to take away first? Like what would you make illegal first? Like if you think the government should be more involved I did not say that. I said the one thing, really the most important thing that the government could do is correct this powerful market failure. If you put up, if you're a solar installer and you're putting up solar panels, you have to clean up on the job site and you have to pay to put away the trash that you've created, okay? But if you're a fossil fuel company, you don't. You get to pour the carbon into the atmosphere for free. And I've given you about 15 powerful reasons for why that's a very bad idea, including the fact that it's creating the conditions of chaos that you described. Now, at the position we're in at the moment, that's exactly right. That's what happened. That's why we need to make this transition and do it as quickly as possible and delaying it and deciding that we should just go on like we are for another 10 or 20 or 30 years because it's more convenient for us is a very serious mistake. Well, I, <coughs> can, can, I, can I say that's not a very specific but, answer? Like, I, I meant like, like, like there's a bridge that has to Excuse get, me, could no. you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, to kind of address where I think the questioner might be coming from, it's, I don't think it's constructive if you're talking about a very, very specific prohibition on human life, namely, we should not be free to use fossil fuels going forward. And again, I didn't come up with the number 95%. Bill gave the number 95%. No, actually, I give the number 80% in that uh, in, article. Your, in your book, Earth, you give 95%. Mm. Um, anyway, 80% is... is I mean, scares me almost, almost as much. So there's just this issue of, of what is going to specifically happen as your practical sources of energy get taken away. So as the factories that can now run cheaply and have just opened up in the US due to cheap natural gas, as, say, fracking gets banned, which Bill is in favor of banning it, what's going to happen as your price of oil goes up? What's going to happen as your price of food goes up. What, what, what good is it going to do you that someone in a room um, gave some prediction about how all of these things would be magically solved in a way they had never been done before that just conveniently happened when you took away the basic solution, which is a fun, abundant, affordable energy? What I'm, I'm, my goal here tonight is just to alert you to a value whose freedom is being attacked. I have no particular interest in fossil fuels except in my interest in energy, that we need energy to live and we need this form for a long time to come. That's why I emphasize nuclear, hydro. Um, what I just want to keep saying is that 80, 95 percent, Bill is not taking seriously the implications of what he's saying and he's not taking seriously, he, he's not really being upfront with how much this would ruin your life, what it would mean concretely. Um, and it would ruin your life, but much more quickly, it's going to ruin the people uh, on the margin. And as for the Maldives, uh, I don't think the evidence is what Bill says it is. But in any case, they need to industrialize, too. They will have a very right. difficult time industrializing when they're underwater. One of the, not, um, not one of the problems. The, with the, the, ne the, nether the Netherlands, right. is, so under the Netherlands is underwater, yeah. by the way. I would like to thank both of you for being so provocative and bringing such a wonderful spirit of debate and conversation to our university. And thank all of you for coming to us. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much.